This video is part 2 of 4, exploring Jane Jacobs' principles for a diverse city. I didn't clarify this in part 1, but in truth, a city can be both urban and suburban, so in fact, we're looking at Jacobs' conditions for diverse urban areas. In the first video, we looked at her first criteria of a diverse urban area, the need for mixed uses, which is perhaps one of the more obvious criteria, even included in the definition of urban. Her second criteria is the need for small blocks. So here's the idea. She says, Condition 2. Most blocks must be short. That is, streets and opportunities to turn corners must be frequent. Shorter blocks mean that people can reach their destinations in a shorter amount of time, and they have more options for reaching their destinations. Let's compare these two examples. If you were at point A and you were trying to get to point B, you'd have three potential routes. In scenario B, where the blocks are shorter, you have six potential routes. The average walker can cover 275 feet in one minute, so a good rule of thumb is that one side of the block should be roughly 275 feet or less, and the other side of the block should be no more than 600 feet, else it should be broken up by a pedestrian path, park, or through lobby. For a typical New York block size, you'd need to walk roughly six minutes to reach point B. If, however, the blocks were smaller or there was a pedestrian pathway, that walk is cut down to only about three minutes. From an economic point of view, businesses can make the most money where paths meet, because this is where the most foot traffic is. This means that businesses are likely to be located on or near corners, and small block sizes mean more intersections and therefore more opportunities for smaller businesses. Long blocks face the problem of dead zones in the middle, but they can potentially be good for residences that favor quiet spaces. Let's look at common grid cities in the US. We have Portland, New York, Chicago, and San Francisco. All of these are generally decent sized blocks, but Portland has the smallest dimensions, and I have to say I do enjoy walking around Portland. That's not to say that I think New York's blocks are too long or anything like that. They feel proportional to the activity level of the street and the tall building heights. It seems that many people love the small block sizes of Portland, and I agree that smaller blocks are better than excessively long streets, but how short is too short? There needs to be a balance, because as a pedestrian, you don't want to be waiting at too many stoplights, and blocks that are too small can make for confusing traffic too, Barcelona is famed for its Manzana blocks and Grid City by Cerda, and with block dimensions of 371 feet, it's slightly larger than Portland's blocks. Although these blocks are quite famous, I personally felt there were too many crosswalks that I had to wait at, and I wasn't a fan of the hexagonal block shape, as crossing the street was more difficult than it needed to be. I think the other factor was that the streets in Barcelona were quite wide and had many lanes of traffic, as opposed to Portland's many one-way streets that were much more narrow making them easy to cross even if you have to cross frequently. Perhaps I'm not alone in that opinion because the city of Barcelona is currently undertaking a super block project that aims to remove some vehicle space and rezone it for pedestrians. If you've been to Barcelona, what do you think? Anyway, I generally agree that smaller blocks are better up until the point that more streets don't provide any difference in travel time. We're talking about blocks in the sense of rectangular plots of land, but cities don't need rectangular blocks to be good cities. Cities without rigid blocks can still be walkable and efficient. In older cities, streets weren't meticulously planned to be perfect grids, they were just created. And yet, I've never found non-rectangular streets to be an impediment or detraction from a city. I would much rather meander through interesting streets than walk a long, boring road. So I would revise Jacob's condition to be not the need for shorter blocks, but the need for frequent streets. Finally, Jacob's issues a word of caution stating, frequent streets are not an end in themselves, they are a means toward an end. What does this mean? Well, there's this thing called a walkability score that determines how pedestrian friendly a city is based on distance to amenities, block length, intersection density, and population density. In theory, this seems like a good way to objectively determine walkability. And here are the top cities in the United States. Well, New York and Boston, I agree, are very walkable cities and happen to be two of my favorite cities in the US. 
but truth be told, out of an overabundance of caution, I would be really hesitant to walk the streets of San Francisco's Tenderloin region alone, especially at night, despite it having a perfect walk score of 100. The conundrum of San Francisco is definitely a topic that I want to explore more, but I'll leave that for a future video since it inevitably involves politics, something I don't want to go into just yet. But we can see that, according to the walkability score, the urban planning should be conducive to a walkable neighborhood. However, it doesn't necessarily tell us if people are actually walking a lot. And this is what Jacobs is trying to say. That short blocks are necessary for walkable neighborhoods, but that just because a neighborhood has short blocks doesn't mean it will be a diverse and walkable city. In the following videos, I will discuss her third and fourth conditions for a diverse urban city, but in the meantime, feel free to leave your comments and thoughts below.